So atoms can form ions, and then ions combine to form ionic compounds. So ionic compounds will generally have very high melting points, and they will conduct electricity if they are melted or if they're dissolved in water. And sodium chloride is an example of an ionic compound. So chlorine is a nonmetal in group 7A. From the periodic table, we can predict that it'll form a charged ion with a negative one charge. So chlorine becomes chloride, and sodium, sodium is in group 1A, and it'll form a plus one. Well, positive and negative electrical charges are attracted to each other, just like the north and south poles of magnets are. So here you have a positive and a negative, and they're going to be attracted to each other, and they will tend to form a compound. And so the sodium and the chloride ions are going to be attracted to each other, and they're going to arrange themselves in a way to maximize that attraction. And they're going to form what we know as table salt, which is sodium chloride. If we zoom in, this is highly magnified picture of sodium chloride, and we see they're nice little cubes. If you go home and you look at the salt in your salt shaker, it's nice little cubes. The manufacturer does not go to any special trouble to make those all little cubes, because who cares, right? Yeah, they're pretty and all, but nobody's going to pay extra for salt that's in a special shape. The salt makes that shape by itself. It wants to be in little cubes, because that's how its ions arrange the best way. It's a crystalline solid, and it has a long-range repeating order of sodium chloride, sodium chloride, sodium chloride. And the way those ions pack together tends to form these beautiful little cubes. What is important to know is that ionic compounds are electrically neutral. So that means however many positive charges you have, you have to have an equal number of negative charges. So the charges on the anions and on the cations must add up to zero. So in that example with the sodium and the chloride, we had sodium with a plus one charge, and we've got chloride with a negative one charge, and we see that plus one and minus one add up to zero. And so we put them together, and we have a compound, sodium chloride, which is what table salt is. When we write formulas for ionic compounds, we're going to always write the cation symbol first, and then the anion symbol. So the cation is the metal. The metals in my, you know, Mrs. K's bizarre chemistry world, the metals are masculine. The nonmetals, the anions, are feminine. So if you're addressing formal wedding invitations, is it Mr. and Mrs. Smith or Mrs. and Mr. Smith? It's always Mr. and Mrs. Why? Because that's the way we do it, right? There's not really a great explanation. That's just what you expect, Mr. and Mrs. So with the ionic compounds, it's always the metal, the cation first, and then the nonmetal. Would we understand what you're talking about if you did it backwards? Yeah, but it, would, it just doesn't look good. Okay, So always the cation first. And then sometimes we have to adjust the number of the cations and anions so that their charges can add up to zero. So if we look at magnesium ion, magnesium's in group 2A, it has a plus 2 charge. Here's our little friend chloride, the minus 1 charge. If we put one magnesium and one chloride together, their charges would not add up to zero. We'd have overall a plus 1 charge. So what we're going to do is we're going to use two chlorides to balance out the one magnesium. And so when we put them together, we write the symbol for the magnesium first, the symbol for the chlorine second, and, and this subscript 2 tells us there's two chlorines. We do not include the charges when we write the formulas. It would be really messy. be all these numbers and pluses and minuses all over the place, and it's not necessary. Because we can figure out the charges looking either at the periodic table or the formula. So we don't need to write those. 
So these ions, when they're by themselves, you have to write the charges. When you put them together in a compound, you do not write the charges. And we know the number of each of them based on their charges. Good grief. I don't know what I did. We look at the number of, we look at the charges and we figure out what, what we have to do to make them add up to zero. So here's a concept check. What's the formula for the compound containing sodium ions and phosphide ions? Phosphide ions have a negative three charge. So some of you are able to just look at this and see what you need to do. And that's great. I'm not, I'm not talking to you. You can just see it. That's wonderful. And a lot of you, it's just not really clear what to do. So there's a couple of different approaches. So let's write these guys down with their charges. And then down here, let's just tally up what the overall charge is. So with one sodium ion, we have plus one. And with one phosphide ion, we have minus three. Do those add up to zero? No. We need more pluses, don't we? So let's draw in another sodium ion. Now what charge do we have? Plus two and minus three. We're getting closer, but still not good enough. If we put in another sodium ion, now we have a total of plus three charge from the, the cations, and we still have the negative three charge from the anion. Those add up to zero. So this is the ratio that we have. We have three sodium ions, and so we say Na3, and we have one phosphorus, so we put the phosphorus there, and we do not put the number one as the subscript. So that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it, which most students like it's called the crisscross method. You have to be a little careful with this, but most of the time it works. So you write the formulas for the two ions and you look at the charges. Plus one, minus three. Not the same. If they're not the same, then you can do this crisscross thing. So you take this understood number one and that becomes the subscript for the P. And you take this number three and that becomes the subscript for the sodium. So we didn't write the one as the charge, and we don't write it as a subscript either. That's not a zero. That's just me circling a, something that doesn't exist. So Na3P. And then there's also sort of an algebra method um, where you would take the charge on the cation, which is 1, and... That's going to be multiplied by some number, and that should add with the charge on that guy and have to add up to zero. And so you need to figure out what x and y are. But if, if that doesn't make sense to you, there's no point in me telling you about it, because you're going to like these other methods better. So this is, this is the answer right here. Any questions? So, I've got a couple minutes left here, so I'm going to do just a couple more examples. So let's do, let's do calcium and sulfide. What would the formula for the compound formed between those two ions be? Well, look at the charges. One's plus two, one's minus two. If we just push them together... Plus 2 and minus 2 add up to 0, right? So, calcium sulfide, CAS. We just need one of each. <coughs> now, you don't want to do the crisscross thing on that because these numbers are the same. If the numbers are the same, don't do the crisscross thing. You'll end up with CA2S2, which is not quite right. How about this one? Fe3 plus... O, 2 minus. The algebra way says, what's the uh, lowest common multiple 
of those uh, 